The house behind me is worth about four and a half million dollars. I could buy this house and spend a million dollars renovating it by 27 years old, but I won't. Instead, I'll tell you the story of how I got the money. I just have to change shirts and remember, meet me in Chicago on July 13th. The story starts a long time before I had ever even tried avocado toast. Oh, and before we get into the video, let's just make this really clear. A five and a half million dollar portfolio means if values go up just 1%, it's kind of like I made $55,000 doing nothing. 2%, 3%, you get the idea. It gets ridiculous. So people are always worried about, well, I want passive income. Well, I want cash flow. Well, you know, I, I want to be rich and I want to be able to retire and go live on the beach of Mexico or whatever and do nothing. The first thing you should do is figure out how am I going to build a net worth? Because once you have a net worth, you can transform all the assets you have into cash flow pretty dang easily if they don't already make you a ton of cash flow. In January of 2008, right before the greatest financial crisis since the Great Depression, I knew absolutely nothing, nothing at all about, well, avocado toast or real estate and, well, quite frankly, school either. See, I went to school, took AP classes and honors classes, but ended up a C and D student and didn't pass a single AP exam. Now, one of the reasons I wasn't exactly the best of students was because I would skip school to go play The Burning Crusade, RuneScape, or Counter-Strike. So I was basically a truant in high school as a junior, and I decided, hmm, what would be a nice way to miss some more days of school? Oh, you know what? I'll go on a school trip to Europe. And on that trip in Paris, France, I met Lauren. See, I went on the trip from South Florida. Lauren went on the trip from this school. So after being long distance for a year, I'm like, well, I don't have a job. I don't have any money. I kind of suck at school. Uh, may as well just try my luck out in California and see what happens at 17 years old. What could possibly go wrong going across country for a girl? Well, this is also where one of the first big changes in my life took place and it really helped shape what I'm able to do now. See, back when I was in Florida, I would take all these honors and AP classes and like biology and history and stuff I didn't really care about. I just do it because I thought I had to do it to go to a good college. Well, then when I came out here, I decided, you know what? Just put me in all of the easiest classes and I'm just gonna study what I want. Which at the time, especially with the recession going on, was everything having to do with finance, the economy, money, credit cards, you name it. Just to understand, how is it that so many people are losing so much money? And how in my life can I do the opposite? And see, there were two things I started learning. I started realizing, wow, wait a minute, there is something really important about credit. So on my 18th birthday, I didn't have a fancy party. Instead, I went to Wells Fargo and opened a credit card on my 18th birthday. In addition to that, I learned so much about the marketplace and the economy that my econ teacher in the basic college prep class that I was taking said, hey, uh, Kevin, uh, do, do you wanna enroll in AP econ? I'm like, nope, I'm gonna keep studying what I wanna study, not what somebody else is gonna tell me to study. Now that didn't exactly help me get into like a crazy fancy college, but it did help me get into Ventura College. But right before I started taking classes here in the summer before I enrolled here, I actually ended up taking my real estate exam to possibly become a real estate agent. Lauren's family knew about real estate. How hard could it be to be a real estate agent? If the median income is like $54,000 for a real estate agent, I could probably make more than the $6,000 I'm making right now working part-time minimum wage. And so during my first semester at Ventura College, I was actually standing right here. This was the entrance to my portable for the first class I had in the morning. And that portable is now gone. So you can see this is now a parking lot. But anyway, I was standing here and I got an email. Oh my gosh, I officially passed my real estate licensing test and now I'm a real estate agent. I'm like, whoa. I don't really know anything about real estate. I just went from selling smoothies. And so what am I gonna do now? So first thing I did was, you might think, get educated. And I did start doing that. But I bought a car. 
about a Prius and thought, you know what? I'm gonna just slap my face on it. I was always kind of against the leasing things. I still am today. I just don't like leasing. I like owning because eventually it's paid off and it's mine and I don't owe anybody anything. You know, so a lot of people are like, oh, well, then you don't get to have a new car every three years. I don't freaking care about a new car every three years. I barely care enough to wash the car. Uh, that's probably not so good for advertising. But it was while I was here at Ventura College that I took my enthusiasm for the market and money and started learning everything I could about real estate and used my car as a way to advertise my services even while I was parked at Ventura College. The funny thing about that was people actually thought I was here teaching college, not taking college classes. So I was like, okay, I'll take it. Sure, let me help you sell your house. So while going to college, not only did I start taking my first real estate clients, but I thought, hmm, what's the next best way to start selling real estate? Well, how about owning real estate? And so that's where we get to the story of this place. Yeah, that house right behind me was actually the first house we ever made an offer on. The problem was we knew absolutely nothing about what to do or what to look for. All we did then was we looked for, okay, well, what could we afford? And in that case, the only thing we could really afford was actually what we now call a wedge deal. That is, we had to look for places that had crummy kitchens, crummy bathrooms, crummy flooring, crummy paint, because that's all we could afford. If the place already had dual pane windows or a newer roof or copper plumbing like this place has, well, then that was just bonus. We just lucked into that. So that's how we had to start, but it also created a lot of fear because this was our first time buying a place and our budget was anywhere between 280,000 to 350,000 bucks. That was it. We couldn't afford a penny more, mostly because, well, Lauren's income and my income was so insignificant that the lenders said, yeah, you guys qualify for zero. So when we co-signed with my father, we were able to buy this place. And what was really frustrating about it was it seemed like everything was getting multiple offers. Even this place had two cash offers on it. And so we got to the point of frustration where it was like, wow, are we really going to miss out on another deal? So finally, we we're just like, whatever, just offer $305,000 on this place that was listed for $287,000 and we finally won. Well, we thought the challenge was over, but the problem was we actually needed help to be able to qualify for the property. And the way we did that was by enlisting my father who was kind enough to co-sign for us. Except he made us start thinking about things that we originally hadn't thought of. Like what happens if things go wrong? What happens if we can no longer make the payment? What would we do? And the first thing we thought is, okay, well, if we move in and for some reason we can't make the payment anymore, we'll rent it. So of course we ran the numbers and thankfully we realized, wow, Wow, even with repairs and vacancy, we'd probably be all in for about $21.50 and the rent was $21.50, at least what we thought we could get on the market. If we needed to sell, we were pretty confident we were getting a good enough deal, although it was the first place we were buying. And if for whatever reason the market fell, shh, don't say that too loudly, okay? Then we thought, oh, it wouldn't really matter because we would just keep it. But then, you know, something interesting happened. We moved in and that kind of uh, lit a fire under our butts to go make some more money. And we did. And so within a year, we were able to qualify for our own loans, which set the stage for the next one. And see, what was interesting is buying that first property was so overwhelmingly scary that I think I got a lifetime of scare out of me. And now I'm just like jazzed on real estate. I find that to be so true with pretty much everybody that has not yet bought real estate, but is part of my real estate investing course, which if you don't know about it, link below, it's like 250 bucks, help you analyze your deals too. You get so many people in there that are looking to start and they have a lot of questions, a lot of fears, and just having somebody to bounce those fears off of that's unbiased in the situation is so valuable to a lot of people. And now it's almost every single week that somebody posts saying, I'm in escrow, I'm getting ready to close. It's so exciting, but I relate so much because I went through that same initial fear, that same, oh my gosh, the flooring guy just called and said, 
there's asbestos under the old linoleum. And I'm like, oh, come on. Like, no, we've already got mold. We've got no kitchen. Now you're telling me there's asbestos and this is bad and that's bad. Like all of the bad news that Lord and I went through initially to start getting into real estate really kind of made us kind of jaded to the idea of bad news in real estate. And you know, out of it, something really crazy happened. Not only did Lauren and I start getting closer because we were spending all this time making trips to Ikea and Home Depot with U-Hauls to save every freaking penny that we could doing drywall ourselves, electrical, it doesn't matter, you name it. Whatever I could do to learn is what I did in that first house. I would do a bunch of outlet changes or, or drywall or whatever, then I'd hire a professional and go, hey, what did I do wrong? Just to teach me so I could learn and what came out of this was I, after a year of owning this property, I'm like, wait a minute, this isn't that big of a deal. So that $300,000 house turned into a now $600,000 house. But after I got through that renovation, after we settled into that first house, guess what the next thing on my mind was? Whoa we need a rental property. If we were able to take a $300,000 house and get it appraised for $450,000 within a year of us doing the fixes, that meant we now got a home equity line of credit and we were able to buy a rental property. Why not? Now it's just a matter of going and finding the deal. So it was right here, it was right here that I remember audio booking and passing out flyers. I remember leaving flyers on these houses and I was just thinking to myself, I have to find it. I'm going to find a rental deal this year. I'm gonna make it happen. I don't know how it's gonna happen, but it, I just feel it. I think I just watched the movie The Secret, and I'm like, sure, if I just keep telling myself that, I'm sure it'll happen. I'm like, okay, so uh, here's the story of what happened next. So next, as I told myself to keep grinding, I made sure everybody knew that I just bought real estate and I just renovated real estate. And what did that do? Well, not only did it start letting people know that I was interested in buying real estate, but it showed that I had the confidence to work with people who were interested in real estate. Now, you don't have to be a real estate agent to do these things, but you do have to be somewhat confident that, you know what, I, I, I'm a real estate investor. Saying I'm a real estate investor took forever because I thought to be an investor, you had to be you know, a multimillionaire. You had to start with 32 units and have $2 million in partnerships and LLCs and all this money to be able to make any money in real estate. I thought, you know what, I'm not an investor. I'm just some kid buying a house. So that really kept me discouraged. But buying that first place and seeing what I was able to do with it, with certainly a lot of effort, but very well compensated effort, I got super stoked. And see, that's where I ended up on this street. See, I always told myself I'd only be interested in real estate that I'd be willing to live in. I would never buy any kind of super, super inexpensive, low-end something where I wouldn't feel comfortable living. And so this particular house behind me was for sale. And remember, I was a real estate agent, so I decided to hold an open house right here at this house. And while I was holding this open house, the neighbor from across the street walked in. That neighbor ended up being the owner of this house right here. And she said, well, would it be awkward to have two for sale signs on the same street? <laughs> Turns out, not only did she not want to put the property on the market and she was willing to sell it to us, but Lauren, my girlfriend at the time, knew the seller. Ironically, the seller used to work in Lauren's elementary school office, and she actually remembered Lauren because Lauren was sick with asthma all the time. And so our first rental property literally fell in our lap. And I, I, I don't know, I mean, part of me is like, whatever, just freaking coincidence. Or maybe there's something to the whole like secret thing. But I think it all really started with that willingness to say, you know what, like we got our worst case scenarios covered. Let's just pull the trigger on number one and we'll worry about the other stuff later. There's a reason why the first video of mine that ever got any decent amount of views on YouTube had to do with encouraging everybody to start. 
All right, step one for everybody who just wants to watch for 20 seconds, you need to buy a place. If you keep watching, you'll learn how and why and all the other tricks that I know and who I am and all that stuff. But if you're only gonna watch 20 seconds, it's about 20 seconds. Because it was that first house that really led me down this real estate investing path. And so guess what happened after we bought this place? and fixed it up with the same experience I had from house number one. Well, we started shopping for yet another house. And now you might be asking yourself, well, why, why would we be shopping for, you know, these little single families like this rather than big apartment buildings and units and, you know, all the sort of stuff that you pretty much hear everybody talk about on YouTube. Well, the reason for that was pretty simple. In order to buy big apartment buildings and units, you need to do what's very simply known as overpay. A lot of these apartment buildings basically take what all of the apartment buildings similar to it sold for before and then they add a premium and then that's what you have to pay. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well they can't charge more than market value. Right, that might be true. But what happens with multifamily real estate is you have a ton of investors competing for these. In fact, research suggests that on multifamily, especially larger apartment buildings, 95% of the time are you dealing with people that are solely investors. They don't care to house hack and live in one of the units or any of that. They're just straight up investors. And oftentimes they're trying to place other people's money because they're running a fund or whatever. And when you're running a fund, you don't care about overpaying. You care about buying and selling crap so you can collect your fee. So what happens? Well, those market values artificially get pushed up. What did I want to do? Well, I wanted to keep doing what I did with my first house and what I did with my second house. Well, that's where I had to make a choice and I realized, wow, wait a minute. On single family, this kind of stuff or the more basic kind of stuff only 11% of buyers are sophisticated investors. That means 89% of people buying places are probably exactly the same as I was when I bought my first place, except they wouldn't have basically had the balls to buy a place with 3.5% down that needed mold work, asbestos work, didn't have a kitchen, didn't have toilets in the bathrooms, all that kind of stuff. I just did it. I just dove in because I thought, oh, what are, what's the worst case scenario? What's the worst that could go wrong? Maybe it was a little crazy at the time looking back, but whatever. It's exactly what gave me that motivation to go, whoa, this is, this is too easy, man. This is like, this is like free money people are leaving on the table. Go ahead. You want to buy units? You want to start with 32 units? You want to go put 35, 40% down? Great. You'll probably not buy anything until you're 40 or 50 years old or you'll get discouraged and you'll give your money to somebody else and then you'll earn your marginal returns. I, on the other hand, was able to take a little bit of my money, like $8,000, $9,000 from Lauren and turn it into over $200,000 in equity in the first place, which we then borrowed against to buy our second place. And you might think, oh my gosh, you borrowed against your $200,000 to buy another place. Well, now you don't have any equity. but. That wasn't true because we put that money down on the other place and we're able to generate another $150,000 in net worth above what we paid for the property and above our down payment. So it's not like we lost our down payment. We still have that money there because we bought another good deal. That's so all of a sudden it was like, oh my gosh, we went from a net worth of like $8,000 and $9,000 to a net worth of somewhere around $450,000 in two years, thanks to real estate. You don't see anybody doing that investing in index funds or funds in general. And notice most of that net worth didn't come from me doing crazy business as a real estate agent. In fact, my first two years in real estate, I made $35,000 and $55,000, and I had business expenses on top of that, so probably had even less. But what did I do? I just kept hunting for deals. Because now, when you have this net worth, on properties that create cash flow when rented out, what are you able to do? You just keep going to the bank and you ask for more money. You go, look, I did really well on these. They cash flow. We could qualify those rents and let us buy another one. So we went shopping for a short sale and well, and yet another really nice neighborhood. Here's the third property we bought using money from the other deals we bought to buy wedge opportunities and create a massive net worth again. This property, because it was a short sale and was also being sold under market, probably bumped our net worth to easily over half a million dollars 
the day we closed. And look, I get it. You might all be thinking to yourself, oh, Kevin, does that mean you're just all debt and no equity? No, in fact, just because I bought my first house with 3.5% down doesn't mean there's no equity. In fact, that first house we bought 3.5% down, probably closer to 40% equity now, and it's worth $600,000. Similar things are true for all of our properties, especially the ones where we're putting 25% down and we're buying them in the wedge. It's amazing what you can do with residential real estate because there's such a lack of competition and the financing is really good. But do keep in mind, I'm a big fan of not over leveraging. In fact, something I talk about on my channel pretty regularly is that I'm not a fan of constantly refinancing and having too much debt. I'm a big fan of, you know, once you have a nice base or something you can retire off of, don't lose it in a recession, you know what I mean? Now, another principle that I'm a huge fan of is doing what's known as buy the median. The median price for real estate in my area is between $580,000 to $610,000, depending on when you look at it. The first three properties we bought are all today worth $600,000. So when I give you advice on this channel, realize I follow that advice also. Next house is the house we live in. Oh yeah, and one more thing, please make sure you, uh, you know, do this. This is my house. I'm super happy because these maples are finally in bloom. But anyway, this place we bought for $600,000. It's probably worth somewhere around $720,000. And we got a loan of way less than both those numbers. Okay, sorry folks, my mic just broke, so I have to use this handheld. Sorry, I know it looks kind of funny, but it's just you and me, don't worry. Nobody else is watching. It's still just us, even though it looks like I'm a news reporter now. Anyway, here's something else I wanted to talk about. I get all these comments all the time from people that are like, oh my gosh, well, if you invest in a single family house, when it goes vacant, it's 100% vacant. Yeah, and that's true. But when you own multiple single family houses, it's kind of like having one 10 unit apartment building, except maybe you have 10 single family houses, they're just spread apart. And yeah, it might be a little bit more work, but I'd rather put in a little bit more effort and get under market value deals, which is exactly what made Warren Buffett rich, than tell people it's okay to overpay for real estate. And don't fall victim to those arguments like, oh, what about scale? Oh, one roof instead of 10 roofs. Ah, what about paying under market value and building a massive net worth every time I make a purchase rather than overpaying when I make a purchase hoping it appreciates. Also, on the note of vacancy factor, see this house right here behind me? Yeah, that house we bought as well. And this one just came up for rental renewal and we got it re-rented within one week. And it was the first vacancy that it had within three and a half years. Some people are like, oh, what if you can't get it rented for, for two years or whatever? And I'm like, Dude, do you think if you drop the price by 50%, you'd get it rented tomorrow? The answer is always yes. In fact, you'd probably have a line of people out of the door, hi there, uh, that are willing to rent the property. And so the question isn't, is there somebody that's willing to rent it? There, there always is somebody who's willing to rent. The price just has to be right. And then stuff rents. We're never worried about vacant real estate. It's never a concern of ours because we just re-rent stuff. And if you have trouble doing that, then just get a property manager involved, which I recommend you do anyway. Now, the other thing that's a good idea is minimize your monthly expenses that are debts that don't matter. See, for every dollar of debt you have, you have to earn $2.30 to be able to qualify for the same amount of real estate. So it makes more sense to pay off like a car lease or credit card debt or student loans so you can qualify for more. The other mistake a lot of people make in real estate is they wait to get pre-approved or they wait to get started in real estate. They suggest, oh, well, I'd rather wait until I have kids or a family to buy a house. I don't want to settle down yet. I don't want to be tied down by a 30-year mortgage. I'm not tied down. If I want to move, I pack up and move. And guess what I get to do? I get to rent out the place I had before it. And the place that I'm moving to, guess what I get to do? I get to buy it again with homeowner occupied loans, cheaper financing, 30 year fixed rate loans. Why not? To me, it's like 
free money. You know, you get a lot of people that jump up and down about all the returns they get and all the different investment vehicles or whatever. But to me, it's just shocking when you can go into real estate and turn, you know, a three and a half percent down payment or a hundred fifty thousand dollar down payment, because putting twenty five percent down or whatever, into an instant net worth boost of a hundred grand or two hundred grand, and over time even more. Because guess the other beautiful thing that happens over time: tenants are paying off the loan, prices and rents go up over time, it becomes easier to pay off the loan, you can pull out more debt if you want, then you can go shopping for more real estate, as long as you're safe about it. Good news is, if prices fall, I don't really care. Because they cash flow, I'm really never worried about going bankrupt. Now, when it comes to buying real estate, I almost always recommend you buy within 30 minutes of wherever you live, because that's the best way to know what the good neighborhoods are, when the neighborhoods become no longer good, which bad neighborhoods are becoming good neighborhoods. It's a great way to get good deals, and it's the best way to stay local and actually be able to communicate with agents and say, hey, I'm a local buyer. I'm not some out of area investor. And surprise, surprise, you'll get better deals doing that. The next place we bought is just barely within that radius. It's about 29 minutes away from here and I'm too lazy to drive there. So instead, I'm gonna show you the before images of this property when we bought it. You can see everything is trashed on the inside. We had started ripping off the tile, but the floors look like they're full of mold. The kitchen's crap, the upstairs is crap, the floor plan was okay, except, you know, I didn't like this post in the kitchen, which ended up being much more of a chore than I thought it would be. Uh, there were a lot of things that I liked about the house and a lot of things I didn't like about the house. The fact that it was within 29 minutes was just like the icing on the cake that was like, eh, it's still okay, I guess it's okay, it was still within my rule. So we bought it and this is what we turned it into. You can see the new kitchen, all the walls are repaired, the bathrooms are new, we even did an addition to it. We did this all with permits, architects, everything beautifully. And that place we bought for well under $700,000 and it just appraised with a nine in the front. Now I'm gonna tell you about a big mistake I made. This one here, and this is a house that I did go in with the intention of flipping. And we not only replaced the sewer line, but we replaced every single drain within the property. We replumbed the house. We did everything with permits, super high quality work, this house right here. We ended up selling it, which, um, I really wish I didn't. And even once we had signed the contract, the buyers are like, we want $16,000 for repairs. Uh, we hadn't done the roof at that point. That was the only thing we didn't do. And we disclosed that. And that was because the market kind of started softening a little bit. We're like, okay, before we start doing roof work and spending more money, let's sell it. The only thing left to do is the roof. And so even though we disclosed it to them, they're like, okay, well now we want money for the roof. And so what did I do? Well, as much as I liked them and thought, okay, you know, they're probably really nice, great people. I didn't want to spend money on a new roof because at that point we would have probably been losing money. We already spent money on new concrete and new everything else. And uh, we went over here and I installed a for rent sign and said, take it or leave it. I'm giving you zero dollars. Well, I think I gave him like a few hundred dollars or whatever. And uh, smart for them, they ended up taking the house because they got a really, really nice house. But to this day, even though I didn't have to pay myself to sell it, I still regret having to pay the escrow fees, the title fees, the other realtor, uh, and, and now I don't have the house. I don't have a tenant in there paying off my loan every single month. Like, it's gone. It's it's out of my life. It's not mine anymore. Whereas if I had a tenant in there, in there I could be standing outside looking at it going, ha, every month you're paying off $500 of my loan. Thank you very much. <laughs> So I know at this point you might be thinking to yourself, okay, well, so we've crossed the $4 million portfolio mark and we don't have crazy amounts of debt. Where did the other portions come from? Well, here's the next one. See, this particular house was on the market for $650,000. I actually tried selling it to some clients of mine and uh, they said, no way, it needs $150,000 of work, we're not interested in it. Well, despite having 10 offers from mostly home buyers and some flippers, I came in, 
offered more money than what the flippers were paying because I'm not flipping it, so I don't need to pay as little as them and I can beat them. And then offered better terms than what all the home buyers were paying because they were all thinking, well, I need to have an inspection on this. Meanwhile, I'm like, you kidding me? House was built in 2003. I can inspect this walking through it and call it a day. And that's exactly what I did. So I wrote the seller a check for $20,000 and said, if I don't buy it, keep the 20 grand. Bought the deal, got it appraised, place is worth over $770,000 now after we did maybe $25,000 worth of work. Thank you very much. I guess the people I showed it to the first time should have bought it. <laughs> now, the other thing is, I'm gonna put an arrow on it because of the tenants outside right now, but you see that house there over my shoulder? Yeah, that's actually the first house that we turned into a rental that we first bought, that first fixer-upper I showed you pictures of. It seems like they've pretty much been home all day, so I didn't wanna just walk up there with the camera. Anyway, let's now come almost full circle here and go to what is the last place on this five and a half million dollar portfolio we're sharing. It's right here. It's worth $600,000. And take a peek, here it is. You'll notice it's literally four houses from the one we first bought. It's actually the same exact floor plan too. So here it is. Uh, this is just finishing with the remodel. Uh, we got the new concrete the new landscaping, the paint inside out. So folks, what are some big takeaways here? I think the biggest thing is don't be afraid to start. Get some education. Honestly, it doesn't have to be my course. That's linked below. If there's also a course there for real estate agents. And remember, you do get private live streams twice a week. You could also meet me in person. Next stop is Chicago. But seriously, what are some big takeaways? Well, get started, get educated, get in the game. Once you're in the game, it becomes so much easier to go to the next step, the next step, and the next step. I, I don't feel like I'm super special. I just feel like I kind of lucked into having basically the balls to go for the first one. And after that, everything was kind of a no-brainer because I became so used to and familiar with everything that why not? Yeah, I also happen to be a real estate broker that served hundreds of clients buy and sell and invest in real estate but that's why I also have a course, is because I know so much to help you do this stuff. But anyway, enough about that. Think to yourself, what are you gonna do next? Make sure to meet me in a place like Chicago or Austin or Seattle or San Francisco, the other next stops coming up on the I'm Over It tour. Oh, and in case you're wondering what that's a reference to, that's a reference to I'm over the lack of education in the real estate world because everybody tells you crap like, oh, well, you need to find 32 units. You're gonna have to go figure out how to get partners and have an LLC because otherwise it's stupid to start. Yet ironically, the same people that tell you that usually own the real estate they're living in and started by buying single family stuff and made a lot of money from single family and then moved into the big stuff. Think of it like a stepping stone. Where are we going now? Big investors. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs>